Okay. We're going to start on the bottom of 87B. Today's daf yomi is 88. We'll start 11 lines from the bottom on 87B. We have learned in the Mishnah if one witness testifies that she is that he's already paid the ksuba to her and she says she hasn't collected it, she has to swear in order to get collect the money. So Sava Rami Barhama may marshfood your raisa. There so Rami Barhama thought to say that this is a biblical oath that she has to say. Why is it a biblical oath? Because there are three examples of a biblical oath in the Torah. The, the Torah says you take an oath. One is what's called the mode of a mixus, a partial admission. A second is shvua shomrim, uh, an oath that you weren't misappropriating the, the deposit that was in your possession. And the third is if one witness makes a claim against you, then you take an oath about that claim. So Rami Barakama thought to say that this was a biblical oath that she has to take in order to collect her ksuba, as opposed to a rabbinic oath. Rashi gives two possible uh, explanations about the difference between biblical oath and rabbinic oath. One is Rashi says that if, if you can't do the biblical oath, you don't reverse it onto the other person. Or else, Rashi says on top of 88a that Biblical oath is less severe with respect to the, the holding of a Torah scroll. I mean, rabbinic oath is less severe. You don't hold a Torah scroll. You don't swear by God's name. So these are some of the possible differences. But a biblical oath is obviously more severe, and she's going to be more concerned about violating it. So Rabbi Barham is to say that she has to take a biblical oath here, that this is biblical. It says in the, in the Torah, that one witness is not enough to make you punished for any sin that you've done. So which means, it doesn't punish you for any sin. But it does punish you with respect to an oath. That, meaning to say it doesn't punish you, but the one witness could force you to take an oath. And we have a statement about this in Shavuos. It says, we learn there that any case where, where two witnesses would obligate you to pay money, one witness can force you to take an oath. So Amarava, you know what it's like? It's like uh, if you're in a lawsuit, you always want to say, where do I get to the point where I can get discovery and force them to do a deposition? So, because then you know you really have them. So one witness can force, you have them concerned, and then, then, then they already have to start going before a judge and start exposing their things and be careful that they don't lie. So one witness can force you to, to get to that point. So Amarava says, no, I'll give you two explanations as why this is not a biblical oath. And all the biblical oaths are where you take an oath and then you don't have to pay. The he, and in this case, meaning somebody makes a claim against you, you owe me a hundred dollars, I have one witness. So you take a biblical oath that you don't owe the money and then you're exempt from them having to pay. But in this case, what she wants to do is she wants to take the oath and collect the ksuba. He nishpas no tell us. She wants to take the oath to collect the ksuba. So that's not the biblical paradigm of a biblical oath. Also here she's denying something. She's she's saying, I haven't got something which as I have a lien on the real estate. Well, that's not an example of a biblical oath. Elam, the biblical oath doesn't apply to something which is a lien on real estate. Elam Rabbi Midra Banan. So the whole concept, the whole oath here is rabbinic. The whole concept here of the oath is rabbinic in order to just calm the husband down. He's like, I have a witness that supports my claim. So therefore, since he has a witness that supports his claim, we say, okay, rabbinically will require her to take a note. And Amar Papa, Rav Papa says now we're on the top of 88A, Ipikehave. So Rav Papa says, if indeed, if indeed uh, the husband is very smart and what he wants to do is he wants to, he wants to force her to take a biblical oath. He wants to turn this from a rabbinical oath into a biblical oath. I'll tell you what he should do, says, says Rav Papa. So you could force her to take a biblical oath. How? He should then, okay, he says he already paid her. She says, no, you haven't. So he's going to have to pay her again anyway. So he now, when he pays her the ksuba, he pays it in front of a second witness. He pays it in front of one witness. Now we have two witnesses who both say he paid. 
Umukim Hanakama Bimalva. So he says, look, the second witness says I paid the Ksuba. So the first witness I'm going to say was a loan. And therefore, since it's a loan, you have to take an oath that you didn't pay it. And that's a biblical oath. So Maska for Rav Shesha, Bredu Ravidi says, no, that won't work. Rav Shesha challenges that. He said, you, you still, how can you combine these two witnesses? It, it still doesn't work because, uh, because there, there's still only one witness in both cases that you pay the Ksuba. And so then she's going to again deny that she paid the Ksuba and that she was paid it. And she's, go, and she, and it's, she's going to swear again and get the money. So that's just going to cause you more problems. So rather, what do you do? So therefore, what you do is El Amar Shishi Bredu Avidi Yavak Subasa Ba'ape Sahadi Kama. What you do is you give her the Ksuva in front of Ape Sahadi Kama Mazada Basra. The second Suva you pay her in front of two witnesses. And then once you've paid her the second suit in front of witnesses, two witnesses, you say, well, the first payment I made to you was a loan. Now go deny that loan. And then you, you have to do that under a biblical oath. So she could still say that the first one was also a ksuva because a woman can claim that her husband promised her two different ksuvas at different points in the marriage. He, he put up a ksuva as a bond. So he could have said, I'm giving you two bonds. No, he tells the witnesses before he pays the second one, he tells the first witness that first witness was a, that first, that first payment was a loan. Now I'm giving this two, these witnesses, this, now I'm doing a ksuba in front of two witnesses. And that's why he clarifies the situation so she can't make that claim. Okay, so now we have, our Mishnah has said that if she had, if um, she wants to collect the ksuba from the chasim meshubadim from property that there was a lien on it, meaning to say she comes to collect the ksuba and he says, I have no money. She says, yeah, but when we got married, you had a house. So that house, I had a lien on it and you sold the house. Let me go and collect that house from the people who purchased it. So there she has to, she has to take an oath in order to collect it from the, from the uh, people who there was a lien on it. So Tanan, so Tanan has something learned in the Mishnah in Shavuos. That the, um, that the heirs, the heirs can only collect the money with an oath. The heirs can only collect the money uh, with by taking an oath. If the heirs want to collect money from people who are uh, uh, creditors, they can only collect the money uh, with an oath. So the Gemara says, Miman, from whom can the heirs only collect the money with an oath? If you want to say it's from the borrower, their father had lent money to a borrower. Now the heirs want to collect the money. They need to take an oath. Well, that doesn't make sense because generally speaking, as a rule, heirs, we protect more than the initial person because they don't know if their father had forgiven a loan. So we generally, generally speaking, protect the heirs. So we say that doesn't make sense. If their father could take the money without an oath, that we would require them to have to take an oath. That doesn't make sense. So therefore, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about here is this is what I mean. If heirs want to collect from other heirs, so one estate wants to collect a debt from another estate, then they can only collect it by taking an oath. That's the only way they could collect the money. So Amar Bizraika, Amar of Yehuda, Lo Shanu Al Shaumram Yesomim. We can only do this when we say that the heirs can only collect from another heirs if they take an oath to the fact. So it says Rav Zreika in the name of Rav Yehuda, Lo Shanu Al Shaumram Yesomim. This is only the case when the or, the heirs say Amaranu Abba Laviti Parati. When do we make them take an oath to collect? When the, when the heirs say, Our father said to us, I borrowed the money and paid it back. But if they said, but if our father said, I never borrowed the money in the first place, then, so the father says, I never borrowed the money, then even, even uh, if the father says, I never borrowed any money from, from this person at all, then even with an oath, you can't collect you can't collect the money. So the Gemara says, we don't understand what this case is referring to. Uh, 
So, so that what we don't understand what this means. It says the Gemara basically Maska for Rabba Adar Rabba, just the opposite. Koa Omer Loviti, whoever says, I never borrow the money, Koma will parati dummy. He's in effect also admitting that he didn't pay. So if the other people have, have evidence that he borrowed the money and they say I never borrowed, for sure he hasn't paid. So if what Rabbi Zer, this is what was actually taught that Amr Zrika Amr of Yehuda, Lo Shanu, when do we say that the heirs can only collect from the other heirs with an oath? When do we say this statement? When the heirs make a claim, when the heirs make a claim that these, and, and they respond, the other people say, our father said he borrowed and paid. But if the, if, the, if the heirs say, actually, our father told us he never borrowed the money at all, then then they have to pay, then they have to pay the money and they don't even take an oath because they are admitting that they never paid anything for sure. Because if they said we never did the loan, then for sure they didn't pay. They for sure never paid. So as long as they'll admit that they didn't pay the loan, as long as they, so as long as there's evidence that the loan took place, if they said I never borrowed the money, then they for sure have to pay and, and, and they can't even take an oath to get out of it. So now we, we learned also in the Mishnah that if the woman comes along and, and she wants to collect a ksuba and her husband's not there, she could collect it, but she needs to take an oath. So Amar Rav Acha Sarabira, so that was his name, Rav Acha Sarabira. Rashi says that was his nickname. He was called Rav Acha, basically the mayor of the town. Ma'isabel's name Rabbi Yitzchak Ban Tokia, Antioch. So, so there was an incident that came for Rabbi Yitzchak in Antioch. When do we say that the woman could collect the money even though he's not there, even though the husband is not there? Only about a ksuva, about a woman's ability to collect a ksuva, because we want to encourage the woman to get married. And we're going to say that you can't collect the money because your husband is overseas. The woman will be afraid to get married. So we want to encourage the, the, the woman to get married. So therefore, we allow her to collect the money even though her husband's not there. But a regular creditor, says Rabbi Yitzchak, uh, uh, says Rabbi Acha Sarabira, um, in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak from this incident in Antioch, then we're not going to let the creditor, we're not going to let the uh, creditor collect from the debtor, from the debtor if the debtor is not there. So, the Rav Amar Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman taught not like that. Rav Nachman said, I feel about Hov, even if their creditor is overseas, it's just a regular creditor, we're going to allow you to basically make a claim on the payment and collect from his assets. We don't want to create a situation where somebody takes the debt, borrows money, goes and goes to the Cayman Islands. He's living the good life on the $10 million loan he took out. But also the, uh, and you're shutting down the door to the borrowers because nobody's going to lend the money. You think banks are going to lend money to people uh, if they can't make a claim unless the person's in the same town? Nobody's going to ever lend money. It's it's just, it's it's a ridiculous situation. So therefore, Rav Nachman says, no, you can't even make the claim against the creditor. Now, it's interesting. They don't have, they're not citing any verses here. They're just citing social policy. We don't want to close the door in front of the borrowers, but it is based upon verse, because the verse does say that it's a mitzvah to lend people. You're not going to be able to fill, fill the mitzvah of lending money. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon said in, a mis- in our Mishnah, called Masha Tovas Ksuvasa, Rabbi Shimon had said in our Mishnah, as long as she makes a claim for her Ksuva, the heirs can make her take an oath. But if she doesn't make a claim for the Ksuva, the heirs cannot make her take an oath. So Rabbi Shimon had said this statement, and we're not we're not sure what he was referring to. So, so the Mara is going to now try and figure out what Rabbi Shimon was referring to, which cause in the Mishnah. Whenever we have something like this, we always ideally try to connect it to the to the uh, to the earlier case. So, Mara says Rabbi Shimon, hi. What's he referring to? I'm a Rabbi Yermia. Aha, uh-huh. he's referring to the the most immediate case prior to this. When Efrei Shalom Befanav. And if she wants to collect the money and he's not there, she can only collect it via an oath. It doesn't matter if it's, there are two aspects to the ksuba. There's the principle and there's the ongoing support. 
doesn't matter if she wants the ongoing support that she's promised or if she wants the principal and she's, you know, like take her buyout basically. Master Rabbi Shimon Mamer, and then Rabbi Shimon comes along and argues and he says, Kolzmach Shakil Vask Subasa, whenever she wants her Suva, Yorshim Mashpinosa, then the heirs. She wants the principal. She wants to take out the, the lump sum, the payment to be done with it. Then the heirs can make her take an oath. But but when she doesn't collect, she's not making a claim for the, the principal, the payment. And then in your The heirs do not make her take an oath under those circumstances because she just wants the ongoing support. So they can't make her take an oath. Uh, she says... Rashi says that this refers to when, when that when it says if she's not making the claim for Ksuba, the heiress can't make her take an oath about Rashi says something else. Actually, I didn't explain the way Rashi said it. Rashi says if she's not making the claim for a main Ksuba, then the heiress can't make her take an oath that she misused funds when she was managing her husband's estate because she was basically what's called an apotropis, a manager that was appointed by the father of the heirs. And Rabbi Shimon's of the position, Rashbag is of the position, uh, excuse me, Rashbag, Rabbi Shimon's of the position that, that she's a manager that was appointed by the father of the heirs. And he says that, that you can't make her uh, uh, take an oath. And the reason is, and the reason for that is explained in the Gemara and Gittin. So therefore, the Kamiflugi, the Pukta, the Hananu Bnei Kohanim Gidon, Rabbi Shimon, and the uh, Rabbanon about whether or not you can make her take an oath if she doesn't claim the Ksuba, that's the dispute between Hanan and the, the children of the Kohanim Gidon. And this was a Mishnah in. We're going to get to this in 104. There's not too many pages left to our track date. Time to order Masachas in the Dharam. Next track date. It's just a lot of fun. But we say that the, this is a dispute between Hanan and the Bnei Kohanim Gedolim. The Tanah, Misha, Allah, Medina, Sayam. Somebody went overseas. V'ishto tovaz mazonos. And the wife is requesting ongoing maintenance. Hanan, Omar. Hanan said, Tishava. Besof, Hanan says she only has to take an oath at the end, i.e., when she takes the full payment. That's when she'll have to take an oath for the uh, to in order to collect the money when she becomes widowed or divorced, and then she'll have to take an oath that she didn't misappropriate the funds while she was while she was married to her husband. But she doesn't take an oath at the beginning in order to collect the support. Whereas that's what Hanan says. But the the Bnei Kohanim Gedolim argue with him. They say no. Even at the beginning, when she wants to collect the money, she she has to take the oath right away. So we would say in our Mishnah, uh, Rabbi Shimon is like the is like Hanan that she only takes the oath at the end when she wants to collect the full ksuba. She takes the oath that she didn't misappropriate funds. Rabbanan can Bnei Kohanim Gedolim. The Rabbanan are like the the Bnei Kohanim Gedolim that whenever she wants to get the support. Then she has to take the oath that she wasn't misappropriating the funds. So Maska for Rav Sheshis or Sheshis challenges this concept. He says, "No, Hi Yorshim Ashbiyono." So according to this, why did you? Well, our Misha says the heirs make her take an oath, but according to this explanation, the more proper wording would have been Betin Ashbiyono. Somebody by the way would have said the court will make her take an oath because it's not the heirs; it's the court makes her take the oath if you want the payment. So therefore, Rav Sheshis says, "El Amar Rav Sheshis, Aha." Rav Shesha says that this is the uh, case we're talking about. Let's say she goes, that it said earlier in our Mishnah, an earlier Mishnah in this chapter, it says if she went straight from the, that this is what Rabbi Shimon is, is commenting on. If she, it says if she went straight from the, the burial of her husband to her father's home, to her father's home, Ona says Apitrapia, and she was not made into an executor, a manager of the property, meaning after the fact, she didn't go back to start managing the property. So then under those circumstances, the heirs cannot make her take an oath. But if she became an executor of the property, the heirs 
well, can make her take an oath about things that happened after her husband died. But they don't make her take an oath about what happened while her husband was alive because he had exempted her from an oath under those circumstances. And about that, Rabbi Shimon comes along. Also, Rabbi Shimon Mamer calls man shetovaz ksuvasa. As long as she's making a claim for ksuva, yorshim ashpino. So the heirs can make her take an oath. Uh, meaning to say, as long as she's making a claim for ksuva, they can make her take an oath that she didn't take anything. But if but if she's not making a claim for the ksuba, they can't make her take an oath, even as when she was an apotropos after the burial. And this is indeed the dispute between Abashal and the Rabbanon, as we learned on Shabbos's daf, or as we learned on as we learned earlier, because it says the Tanaf, this is from the Mesachta and Gitin. Let's say there was an uh, executor or manager of the property of the estate who the father appointed. Yishava minuhu. So you saw Yishava minu. So if there was an if there was an apotropos who was who was appointed to manage the property of the heirs, then when the heirs, excuse me, apotropos minu Yishava. That if there was an apotropos who was appointed to manage the estate, then the orphans, when they get older, can make him take an oath that he didn't misappropriate. And we don't have to be concerned that as a result of this oath, he's going to say, well, I don't want to be this trustee. Why do I want to be this trustee? I'm going to have to go into court. Because uh, because if, if he hadn't been so grateful to his father, he wouldn't have agreed, to their father, he wouldn't have agreed to be the, the, the executor in the first place. So the oath is not going to prevent him from being the executor. Whereas Minu Bezdin, but if the court appointed him, but if the, if he's a court appointed trustee, then we're not going to make him take an oath because nobody's going to want to do it. He doesn't feel any personal sense of gratitude to the court that he's going to agree to this job, which is thankless. Abashal says, Abashal says it's just the opposite. Minu Bezdin, Yishava. If the court appoints him, then we're going to make him take an oath at the end because then he's being appointed by the court. It's a very prestigious position. He's a special trustee appointed by the court. He's going to he seize more, more opportunities for this line of work in the future. But, and Rabbi Shimon says, uh, excuse me, but Minu Avi Yisom, well, he's Shava. But if the father appoints him, he's, we don't make him take. Uh, we don't make him take an oath because he says, this is just like, what do I need to do this for? I don't need this headache. And so therefore, here we're also talking about a case where the father appointed him. So therefore, since this is the case where the father appointed him, maybe Shimon says that if she's not appoint, if she's not asking for the ksuba, he holds like Abba Shaul, that he holds like Abba Shaul if she's not, if she's not asking for the ksuba. Um, and, and therefore, that that we don't make her take an oath. The Rabbanan, whereas the Rabbanan who argue with Rabbi Shimon, they they all like the Rabbanan who say um, that since she's appointed by the by the father, then we're we're going to we can make her take an oath because because since he was appointed by the father, we can make him take an oath because he, he he's doing it for his friends, so he, he'll be willing to do it even though he's being he's he's he has to take an oath at the end of it. So Malzgavu Abai Abai challenges this. Because high calls mancha tovask suvasa, then why does it say uh, the language of the Mishnah says Rabbi Shimon says as long as she makes a claim for ksuba, it should say im tovas if she makes a claim ibrayalim. So there, if she makes a claim, it's when we stated. So therefore, El Harabaye Rabbi Shimon is referring to the following situation. Aha, it's about what it says back in our Mishnah in eighty six b. Cause of uh, let's say the husband writes to her the following neder. He says, I'm not going to make you take a vow or an oath. Then he's not going to be able to make her take an oath. Neither. Neither. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to take an oath now or my heirs nor those who come into my domain. Or your heirs or those who come into uh, who you give it to. So he's not, he's not going to be allowed to make any of them take an oath. He basically says no oaths. The author of Shimon comes along and says, whenever she makes a claim, then the heirs can make her take an oath. Rabbi Shimon basically says, 
if she's going to claim her ksuba, he could still make her take a nose. It doesn't matter, even if he says that to her. And they're arguing about the dispute between Abishol, Ben Ema, Miriam, and the Rabbanon, which we had earlier on 87a, where Ben Abishol, Ben Ema, Miriam says that, that when you make a take, try to collect payment from the heirs, you have to take an oath. Even though the father of the her husband had said you're exempt from an oath, so that, since the sages have an overriding reform that if you want to collect money from an estate, you always have to take an oath. It doesn't matter what he said, and therefore Abba Shol says you have to take an oath, and that's like Rabbi Shimon here and the Rabbanon. They all like the Rabbanon who say no, even though they say you always have to take an oath to collect from heirs. In this case, you don't because he specifically waived that right. So Maske for Rav Papa Hatenach calls Manchet to ask Suvasa. Okay, so he says, this makes sense. Rabbi Shimon says, well, as long as she makes a claim for her ksuva, then the heirs can make her take an oath. Uh, but, but what about what it says, ksuvasa, but if she doesn't make a claim uh, for her ksuva, the heirs can't make her take an oath. What's this teaching? So So he says, right, at first, so Rabbi Shimon is arguing in both cases. So yes, at first Rabbi Shimon is saying that whenever she makes a claim for a ksuva, she has to take she has to take an oath in order to get it, even though he has forsworn, the, even though the husband has waived that rights. But when he says at the end that if she doesn't make the claim for the ksuva, the heirs cannot make her take an oath. What's it coming to exclude? Then Rabbi Shimon is saying, I'm arguing with Rabbi Lazar and Mahuto. I'm arguing with Rabbi Lazar and the one who Rabbi Lazar was arguing, his Tanakama. They argued if the if the if the husband can always make her take an oath and say that she didn't misuse even like small items from the kitchen, that she didn't steal, um, that she didn't steal like dough or thread from the from the household. And so therefore, both and both Rabbi Lazar and he argues, and, and the Tanakama there say that that they can make her take an oath unless he exempted her. And this, Rabbi Shimon is arguing and saying, no, if she's not making, making a claim for the ksuba, then you can't make her take an oath about this. Uh, well, the heirs can't make her take an oath that she misused the family money. Okay, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to address them. This is today's daf. Um, any questions?